Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with the AC Tech, and in this tutorial we're going to talk about creating a layer movement profile and setting up kill boxes in the geometry window. So a layer movement profile is basically a series of sequential movements that Newton will execute for a layer. I've opened up a, an example that's actually on our website. This is a, a bucket we fill up this gray box with material and then we move this bucket through the material and pick up some and scoop it up. So if I open up my movement, my layer movement profile, this is going to show me the, the profile for the current layer. So if I want, let's go ahead and move this down here and shorten that up a bit. If I switch to my bucket, there's already a profile in here. So basically, this grid contains all the movements that will be executed. You have a start time for the movement, you have a XYZ surface velocity, an XYZ movement velocity, a rotation rate, and a rotation vector. So if you recall, the surface velocity doesn't physically move the triangles, it just gives it a velocity similar, it's identical to the velocity control right here. So you would use the surface velocity if, let's say I imported, a, I imported a belt and I wanted to set up a bunch of different velocities for that belt. Well obviously in the, in the normal DXF window you can only start, set up a start XL, stop decel, restart, restart XL. You can't do any more than that. But in this you could set up up to 100 different, um, 100 different motions. And if you wanted you could have up to 100 different surface velocities attached to that belt. Secondly, we have our, our XYZ movement, which obviously is just linear motion of the layer. It's just like our movement here, begin movement time and moving time and the velocity. So you would set up your start time for the movement and your XYZ move velocity. And then finally we can do rotational movements as well. If you recall, for our rotation, we need a rotation rate and a rotation point and a rotation axis. The way this works is it will use the rotation point that's specified for the layer. However, you can modify the rotation vector for each of these movements. So what you would do is I know that the point of rotation for this bucket, if I show my UCS icon, switch back to wireframe, Okay. That is my zero 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 point. So if I look at my bucket profile right now, my, my point of rotation is at zero zero zero. So if I do rotations, it's gonna any of any rotations that I set up here are going to be using that same rotation point. And I've specified my rotation vector as one zero zero, which we can see is this this horizontal direction. So we're going to be rotating the bucket back and forth about that x-axis. So something to note, when you do your rotation vectors, if you, you, can only, you only need to specify one rotation vector and it will assume that all the following movements would use that same rotation vector unless you change it. So if I change this to 0, 2, 0, now it will assume that any, one, any rotations following this would use a different vector. And another thing to note is if I know that this is only going to use one rotation vector for the entire movement, I can just specify that rotation vector uh, right here and then under this axis. I could say here's my rotation axis and here's my rotation point. And then I don't even need to enter any data into these boxes at all. All I would need to tell it is what's the rotation rate. But if I wanted to set up different vectors, I would want I would need to specify all of them. So another thing to note is, well, you might say, well, if you can only specify one rotation point, what happens if you want to combine linear movement and rotation, like I'm doing here? This bucket's going to move forward and then rotate, and then move up and rotate, and then move forward and rotate again. And what happens is, any X, Y, and Z movements that are in the profile are going to be duplicated by the, by the rotation point. So as the layer physically moves, that rotation point gets moved along with the layer. So as long as I specify that rotation point exactly where I want it to be, it, well, it doesn't matter. It will always stay constant relative to the physical position of that layer. 
So with the start time, you'll notice there's no column for end time. And Newton just assumes that this profile, this movement, will continue until the next movement. So at the next movement, we'll then do a y, y motion. So the first thing that happens is actually nothing. We can see that at time zero, there's no movement. All we did was define our rotation vector here. I could have defined the rotation vector here. I could have defined it here. I could have defined it up in here under my uh, rotation axis. However, take note that you have to have that rotation ve vector defined either in this location or somewhere in the grid before we get to our first rotation or at the first rotation. Because if I try to define the vector down here, you know, Newton would be running the simulation and, and it gets to here and says, oh, there's 30 degree rotation, but there's no vector here and there's no vector here. So what vector am I supposed to use? So it'll th it would throw an error before you run the simulation. It would say, it would say, hey, the layer profile has rotational movement, but we don't have a vector yet. Fix your vector. So if I went and threw that right there, now I try and run it again, it's going to bark at me. Oh, there are particles. I was going to say I thought there was no particles in there, but it'll start that. Let's go back in there. Switch to my bucket. So this means that your your layer movement profiles have to contain dead spaces where you don't want there to be movement. So as you notice, this, this very first vector, this very first move time of zero, I, had, I was only defining my vector, right? And then from zero to three, there's going to be no motion. So from three to five, we have motion. From five to six, there's rotation. Six to seven, there's movement. Seven to nine, there's movement. And then nine to ten, we have rotation. But you'll notice that, so this rotation is going to end at ten seconds. And because I know that I only wanted to rotate this for one second, I had to enter a final movement at the end with zero velocity and zero movement. Because otherwise, at nine, it would have started rotating, but it would never stop. It would keep rotating all the way to the end of the simulation. So you have to, you generally at the end of this LMP, the layer movement profile, you want to define a zero movement. And that just says, okay, now here's where we're going to cease all of our movement. So certainly we can add moves, we can delete moves, we can move moves up, shift them around. If I try to shift this up, I'll notice if I try and run it, it says, okay, wait a minute, your movements are out of order. We can't have a five second movement before a zero or a three. You can even import and export these profiles from a CSV file, which is pretty handy if you want to be, be creating your movement profile in, C in the CSV file. So if I go ahead and export this to there, export successful. Well, let's go ahead and open that up and take a look. Oh, well, we can see it's the exact same columns. And what's nice is that I don't see a whole bunch of zeros everywhere. You don't have to put zeros everywhere. Certainly with this vector, we'll put zeros there for clarity so we can tell that the X rotation vector is one, zero, zero. But anywhere else, as long as you make sure that you have, you know, defined uh defined your your how many do we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve nope nope eleven we've got eleven columns here so you gotta make sure that your csv file if i was to open up this csv file in notepad you can see that each of these rows has the appropriate number of commas there should be uh, ten commas or nine commas or however many there should be but the point is that it needs to know that these are empty spaces they don't have to have zeros everywhere but it does need to know that there are placeholders there so similarly i could go back and import that profile and of course it's the same thing so with your your movement profile with your layer movement profile you can only have up to 100 movements if your csv file contains more than 100 movements it will only import the first 100 and it will warn you and say hey there's more than 100 i'm only going to import the first 100 and then regarding your layer movement profile this pr movement profile will supersede any other movement it will supersede um the layer movement, linear rotational movement, and it will, will supersede your cyclic motion. So anything that you enter in any of these boxes is going to be completely ignored if you're using a movement profile.
So that's just one thing to note if perhaps you you were messing around in the layer movement profile and you accidentally added a move and then you were and then but you didn't really want to use movement. So then you were in here um, setting up cyclic motion or setting up rotational motion, but it, it it's not duplicated. You won't see it in the simulation because it's still using this one CSV movement that you accidentally added. So you need to make sure to check that if you're not seeing your movement. And by the same token, your cyclic motion will um, override any linear or rotational motion. I had forgot to mention that in the last animation. So the, the rotational motion will override linear motion. Cyclic linear motion will override rotational or linear motion. The rotational cyclic motion will override any of the rest of this and your movement profile will override all of that so it's it's in in order of increasing importance you know this movement profile at the bottom would would just supersede everything that's here so certainly i can clear my profile or i could clear all profiles if i want and there's a nice little handy help button that will describe, hey, here's what each of these things are, here's what they mean. And I think it gives you a, a reminder about the, about the rotation vector. So let's go ahead and watch that quick animation. There we go. So right here where it's telling us what's going on. Fill up the bucket with material. Now we're going to go ahead and move our bucket forward at 1.4 meters per second. We're scooping up that material. We stop, and right here we're rotating the bucket upward. We lift it up, and we're going to move it forward. We've changed our view to show velocity instead of elevation. Then we're going to stop and rotate it to dump our material. and that's all. You'll note that you cannot do any uh, you can't do any cyclic motion in the movement profile. You couldn't do you know two or three different types of cyclic motion sequentially. You only can do your cyclic motion right here. So I think that about covers it for the layer movement profile. Now let's talk about the kill boxes. And these are pretty handy. I'm going to go ahead and open up a different file, the shoot fill. If you recall from one of our earlier uh, tutorials, we showed you this shoot fill geometry. And maybe you noticed that there was this gray box down here. That's a kill box. So what a kill box does is it simply deletes any particles that enter it from the simulation. So I wanted the simulation to run quickly. And I know that you know the material. If we if we go back and watch that um, that animation that I showed you, you can't see anything beyond the end of this belt here, beyond the end of the skirt. Because I knew that I wasn't going to show anything beyond this skirt, because there's a transition section here. But of course, your your receiving belt isn't actually this big. I just had that transition section there for for some other reason, but I didn't want to show anything. So I made sure to set up a kill box here, because the kill box killed any of the particles as soon as they got to the end of the simulation. So I, I saved myself a little bit of computation time by not modeling the particles as they flow off the end of the belt. Because I knew that I was not going to show that in the animation anyway. Another thing that I could have done, so if I, if, if I go into my kill box window you can see you can enter up to 10 kill boxes. Whichever one you have highlighted is, is shown in magenta. Just a nice handy feature there. You set your min and max bounds for X, Y, and Z and you set your activation and deactivation time. So if I didn't want this kill box to turn on until 5 seconds, I could say that. And maybe I wanted it to turn back off at 10. You can enter those right there. If these values are blank, it just assumes the kill box is active the whole simulation. And of course it'll notify you that right here. It'll let you know. So I could also, if, if I wanted, another thing that we actually do quite commonly is set up a kill box underneath this this high uh, feed belt because you know that if a particle drops off this feed belt it's gonna speed way way up as it falls through this empty space and when that particle exceeds your maximum expected velocity the variable time step is gonna start to to decrease itself proportionately 
because in order because Newton will detect that hey I've got at least one particle in the simulation is moving really fast so we need to have a really small time step to capture all of that but we we don't want to slow our simulation down like that plus we don't want to see particles falling off the belt or or falling out of other spots where there shouldn't be particles we we don't want to see that in our animation so why don't we just set up a kill box to to get rid of those particles the instant they fall off the belt so the way you do this is pretty simple well there's our origin, set it up in the y direction. Negative 10, negative 8, sure, negative 8 to negative 1, negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.75, cool. x direction, if I go back to a top view here, well, uh, what do we want? Negative 1 to 1, that looks good. Let me go back to my side view, and in the z direction, we can go 0 to 0 0.5. Nope, oh, much too high. Let's do negative 0 0.5 to 0. And actually, when the particle falls off, it might it might fall off a little bit further to the side. It might miss the kill box. So let's set this up from negative 2 to 2. So now any particles that fall off this belt, we're going to capture and remove from the simulation right away. So where else might I want to set one up? Well, I look at this transparently. Yeah, let's look at it solid. You can see in the back here. I wonder if I'd have would I have particles that that can happen to um, exit the chute and travel backwards? Almost certainly not. But if I wanted to, I could set up a kill box right here as well. So you can set up up to ten of those, and it's easiest to set up your kill boxes right here. But actually, the way we used to do it is you had to insert the kill box into the geometry for your for your model. If you were using a DXF file to import your model, you would actually define, you would draw a box like this, and you would put it on a layer called, I believe it's called Kill 1. It's in the manual here. Let's take a peek. Kill boxes. So two ways to implement it. You can input it using the kill boxes window, which is much easier to do. But this old way would say, oh, put it in the geometry of the CAD file, you name it kill 1, kill 2, kill 3, up to kill 10. So the kill boxes have to be rectangular prisms. And they have to be oriented with the x, y, and z axes right now. We're going to be implementing a, a feature that allows you to to rotate this kill box. In uh, you can incline the kill box about that x axis, and you can rotate it about the z. So that would give you the ability to to take that horizontal, take that rectangular prism, and orient it however you want for capturing those particles. Because what if what if my what if this belt here? was at say an angle of uh, a rotation angle of 25 degrees well now it's a little bit more difficult to line up my kill box with that belt I suppose I could just go ahead and make it you know bigger in the X direction you could say let's make it negative 5 oh wrong one negative 5 uh, not negative 5 we'll positive 5 there we go and that would work but now what if this belt had some some incline you know, if we gave it an incline of 20 degrees, well, I can't incline that box. All I could do is 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 drop that kill box, so I can go and, and lower it down. So it's negative four to negative three. But now I have this empty space up here where the particles have to fall pretty far before they reach the kill box. And so the point is that for the time being, these kill boxes need to be aligned with the x, y, and z axis. So I think. That pretty much covers it for kill boxes and layer movement profiles. So if you have any other questions regarding that, go ahead and consult the manual or send us an email at info at ACTech.com. Thanks.